Budget handhelds are everywhere, but one thing we haven't seen is Windows handhelds that are a little bit more budget oriented. The Loki Zero here is probably the first Windows handheld that I can say is truly a budget device. The Ioneo Air Plus i3 came close at $269 US dollars for the early bird, but the price quickly doubled. I know a lot of people in the community were really hoping this device was going to be the first true Windows budget device, but unfortunately we did didn't get what we were looking for. Well, a hundred people did. So if you weren't one of the lucky hundred people to get this price at 269 US dollars, well, the Loki series aims to fix that with the Loki Mini Pro and the Loki Zero. The model that I have here is the eight gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage. Fair disclaimer as well, this was sent to me by the company, but they are not paying me for this review and they're not seeing it before it goes up. All opinions are my own and I'm gonna give you my honest thoughts to what I think about it. If you've been waiting for a truly budget oriented Windows handheld, I think you're going to be extremely impressed with this device. AYN has also released a firmware update for this device in the BIOS that allows us to change the VRAM as well. And I might be taking a closer look at that down the road. But if you're looking for a budget device, does this one check all the boxes? Well, it checks a lot for me. Let me tell you a little bit more about that. Without further ado, let's open the Loki Zero and take a closer look to see if this is truly the budget Windows handheld to get. <laughs> unboxing is pretty premium actually. I was not expecting a box this nice for this device, especially at the price that it currently goes for. The box is pretty unique. It looks like you have to open it like this. Let's open the box and take a closer look inside. In the box we find some documentation. We'll take a closer look at that in a second. And underneath that we have of course the console itself. Let's get this out and set that aside for now. Doesn't look like there's anything else in the box either so we'll put that aside. In the carrying case we also get a 100 watt charger and this feels really premium. This actually reminds me a lot of the ones that come with the INEO devices. We also get a nice USB-C to USB-C charging cable. We also get a standard adapter kit here so we can use a different plug with it. In the documentation package we also get a tampered screen protector. That's really nice to see. I was kind of curious if that was going to come with one. We have a nice instruction manual in here as well and it shows us our shortcuts here too. On the back side of that we have some more hotkeys as well as our keyboard and mouse shortcuts. Because the Loki comes with a case I do want to check this out as well. The front of it does look like one of those TomTalk cases and we have little indentations where the buttons and joysticks go. On the top we have a rubber grip. This actually feels really nice when you're carrying it. The zippers also have a subtle grip to them and I think that's really nice when you're trying to close it. Let's open this up and take a closer look on the inside. At the top we have a little paper thing here that says thank you for your support. We also have a little area up here for your micro SD cards or anything else you want to store in there. This is also a very soft velvety material and we have a soft velvety material on the back that goes down to protect the screen. There's also some cutouts here for the grips on the back of the device. Device. The console fits absolutely perfectly. There's a little bit of wiggle, but it's not too bad. And overall, it holds the console really well. If we close this down here, let's take a closer look. Yeah, that's not too bad. Feels like a solid little case. Having this come with the console really adds a lot of value too. And this seems to be pretty dang straight. That is a pretty good stitching job on the zipper area. The zipper is also hidden between this little seam right here. So it gives you a smooth finish on the edge. Excellent little case. I like the brand branding here too. It's got like a little rubber to it. You do also want to take this out before you close it as the joysticks will hit this. With that out, the joysticks can go into these little cutouts. I think you'll be pretty happy with that case. Now let's talk a little bit about the specs first. The Loki Zero starts at 249 US dollars and it only comes in black. The model here that I have is 275. Mine has the 8 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage. The AMD Athlon 3050E is kind of nostalgic for me because the first computer that I built as a kid when I was 10 years old had an AMD Athlon 2500 in it. This is a dual core four thread processor that can boost up to a max of 2.8 gigahertz. It's also built on 14 nanometer process so that's not too bad efficiency wise. Most desktop processors today are built on 7 nanometer or smaller so this is definitely older but it's still really efficient. It also has integrated graphics here with three graphics cores reaching up to one gigahertz. 
This comes with dual channel DDR4 memory and 64 gigs or 128. They also have a 256. The internal storage is EMMC based, but I imagine the 128 and the 256 are NVMe. It also comes preloaded with Windows 10. We get a 6 inch 1080p screen, some good ergonomics. Overall, this looks really impressive. We also have a 40.5 watt hour battery, which is similar, almost on par to the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally. Although with the 40 watt hour in this one, I think we can definitely get some good battery life. We also have Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 4.2, which should be really good for streaming. Another thing that I just noticed here is that it also shows as using a 46.2 watt hour battery but up here it also shows a 40.5 watt hour battery it's also worth noting that this is out of pre-order phase so these should be shipping now looking at the device here initially it seems pretty impressive the first thing that i noticed from picking up the device is how ergonomic it is these grips on the back are really nice and the full-size joysticks on the front are definitely better than the ones that i've seen on the ineo air devices now it's kind of interesting because this device here was also one of the ones that I was very interested in initially before going to the Ioneo devices. However, since I've been using those Ioneo devices for a while, I am going to compare the Ioneo Air Plus because it's similar in size to this one here. The closest device in size I have to the Loki Zero is the Ioneo Air Plus. The Ioneo Air Plus is probably only about maybe a centimeter shorter on the side, but the thickness is almost on par. I would say these two devices are extremely close. The bumpers and triggers are also similar shape, although one thing I do like about the Ioneo devices is having that USB port on top. I had to charge this last night and being able to only flip it around to put the charging cable in the bottom was kind of a pain, although I can see this is designed more for a dock, so I kind of get the point as to why it was put on the bottom. If you look at the Loki Zero versus the Air Pro that I have here, the Air Pro is definitely smaller. The thickness is comparable though and I think these are pretty dang close. Though the Loki Zero is a little thicker though in my opinion. My main handheld for a little while has been the ROG Ally and you can definitely see the size difference between these two. The ROG Ally is a good inch, maybe inch and a half wider. If you're looking at handhelds in general, the Switch Lite, even with my Spigen case on here, is definitely smaller than the Loki Zero. The thickness on the Loki Zero is also a lot thicker, even with this big case on here. First thing that I really want to take a look at is these joysticks. These are not hall based, but they are really good joysticks. We also get really good range of motion and they're also full sized. These are going to be similar to the same height that you're seeing on devices like the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally. If you're looking to play something with shooters or something similar to that, it's going to be nice having these full sized joysticks on there. We also have have a small LED ring around the joystick itself and the material around the joystick is matte, not glossy like we see in a lot of joysticks. That's actually really nice. I like the matte texture a lot better. That's because the cap is the same one that they used on the King Kong Pro 2 controllers. Obviously, the joystick base here is silver and it's black on the low key, but the cap itself feels exactly the same. First impressions, I'm really impressed with these joysticks. I think I'm going to enjoy gaming on these a lot more than I enjoy gaming on the Ioneo Air. The face buttons here are Xbox style EBXY and they are rubber membrane based. They're not bad, I think the size is actually perfect and these are some of the best face buttons that I've seen on a console. These do feel somewhat similar to the ones on the Ioneo devices but these are smaller face buttons for sure. Overall though, these still are both great face buttons. The D-pad is dome based and it's very slightly clicky. It's actually not a really bad D-pad, don't mind this at all. I still prefer a rubber membrane but as far as dome switches go, this isn't too bad. Usually the sound really bothers me but this isn't too loud at all. Between this and the one on the Ioneo Air devices, I think I do prefer the Air one a little bit better but it is pretty mushy and that does bother a lot of people. The one on the Ioneo Air devices is also rubber membrane based so it's definitely not a dome switch and we don't get that click that you would see on the Loki. As far as how these sound, these are not the loudest buttons in the world, but I'm going to see if I can get some audio of what these sound like for you guys.
we also need to check out the speakers on these two devices. Since this one is more closely compared to this one than any other device I own, I kind of want to see what the speakers in this one sound like compared to the Loki Zero. I'm going to be trying it here with the Rune Factory 4 audio, so we're going to see which one sounds better. Because these get extremely loud at 100%, I won't be testing at 100% volume. Between both of these devices, I think the audio is pretty similar. The air sounds mildly tinny, at least to my ear, but both sound pretty decent. If you're looking for good speakers, both of these are pretty good. The only other thing that we see on the front is our select and start buttons, as well as two programmable buttons here. These can also be used for shortcuts. The bottom of the device doesn't really show us anything interesting, but we do have our micro SD card reader, a 3.5mm headphone jack, and our Type-C port. The Type-C port is also capable of doing video out, and we have a small microphone in the bottom as well. On the top of the device, we have our power button, our volume buttons, a power LED indicator, as well as our two bumpers and our two triggers. We also have the air exhaust coming out the top here, and as you can see, we also have a massive copper heatsink on the inside here. This should provide ample cooling for the device, and I honestly think they went overkill for this, but that's really nice to see. You can never have too much cooling. I do also want to show you guys what this fan mode sounds like on the couple different modes here, just so you can get a sense of how loud it is. Let me load up a game, and I'll have that in the background, and we'll adjust the fan curve accordingly. To get the temperatures up to what you kind of see in a normal gaming situation, I'm going to turn this to 20 watts, then I'm going to set the fan accordingly. First up, let's try the auto mode. And to make the console run a little warmer, let's try 1080p. Let's give this a little while to heat up. Once it gets to about 60, I'll let you see what the fan sounds like. Let's also try this custom fan curve out next. Last but not least, let's just try setting this to a manual. Bear in mind that was recorded with the microphone right outside of the vent itself. It is audible even from about 2 or 3 feet away on auto or manual here at 45%, but it's not too bad. I do think that the fan in this is very similar to the one in the iNeo Air and the Air Plus. The one in the iNeo Air Pro is probably louder though, so this is not a bad fan. It's also pushing out a lot of air, which is very impressive. Overall though, what I usually do is just set it to about 45% in manual mode and just kind of leave it there. The noise doesn't seem to bother me and I think it's really good for a decent little handheld like this. I recorded all that in 20 watts too and you likely won't be running 20 watt TDP in all scenarios, so it's probably going to be a lot quieter. That was probably the worst case scenario of what you're going to hear. As far as the bumpers go, they're pretty decent, and you can click them from anywhere. They're also not really loud, like on the Gully Kip King Kong Pro 2, those drive me absolutely crazy. These are some of the nicest bumpers I think I've actually seen on a handheld, and I'd probably put these on par with the Ioneo Air devices. I think the ones on the Ioneo Air devices might be a tad bit better, but they're also a little bit more quieter, and I do like the contrast and color to the device. I think that's kind of what makes these devices stand out from a lot of the other ones is this color here. It kind of looks really cool and I really like it. That being said, if the ones on the Ioneo devices are a little bright for your liking, these are excellent bumpers. And I still really like the black. As far as the triggers go, these are excellent triggers. They are hall based and they're really smooth. You also get a pretty good range of motion here. And overall, these are still some of the best triggers that I've seen on a device too. Overall, I'm really impressed with what I'm seeing so far in this device. The only downside of these triggers here is how loud they are if you put them down a little too quick. They do kind of bottom out and you are going to hear that. Let me see if I can show you guys what this sounds like. It's also worth noting that this same sound is observed on the Ioneo Air devices. The Air Plus and the Air Pro that I have both make this sound if you push down the trigger too quick. 
However, I've used these almost extensively for on the go and it hasn't bothered me yet, so I don't think it's going to bother me on the Loki. On the back of the device, we have a massive air intake here, which should help immensely with cooling the device. We also have a small LED here with the logo and two programmable paddles. I believe Russ mentioned using these for reloading and shooters, so I might try that down the road. As far as ergonomics go, this one has some very pronounced grips on the back. These aren't quite as deep, obviously, as the ones on the Steam Deck, but they are better than the ones on the ROG Ally. I would also say that these are better than the ones on the iNeo Air devices. The Air devices also have a grip on the back, but it's definitely not as pronounced as on the Loki. I believe the biggest differences between these two devices are definitely these grips and those joysticks. The joysticks on the Air are similar to the ones that you're going to see on the Nintendo Switch. The ones on the Loki though are definitely better if you prefer a full-size joystick. Those full-size joysticks are going to come in handy with racing games, shooters, or anything else that requires a little bit more accuracy. I do find the ones on the air decent, but they are really hypersensitive and it's really tough to aim with snipers or something in a shooter. You can also see the drastic differences between those two grips on the back here. As a package though, this device is pretty ergonomic, and I do really think these joysticks are being helped by these grips on the back. I do find my pinkies dangle off the bottom here when holding the device, but that doesn't really bother me, especially when gaming. The last thing on the shell that I thought we should look at is the plastic itself. It actually feels really high quality, and for matte black, this does seem to resist fingerprints pretty dang good. I thought this thing was going to be an absolute fingerprint magnet, but for the most part, this seems pretty decent. I do think time will tell how well this shell holds up, but first impressions are really good. You can see a little bit of the fingerprints under my bright studio lights here, but for the most part, if you're sitting in a bright room or if you're just gaming, you're not going to notice a lot of this. This is pretty good for matte black for resisting fingerprints. Obviously, matte black isn't going to be as good as white or a lighter color for showing fingerprints, but it's not too bad. This is something that usually bothers me on consoles, but I'm actually not bothered by it so far. The iNeo Air Pro that I have, because the plastic is slightly more glossy, it does show the fingerprints a little bit better. Fingerprints have been an issue on this device, but it doesn't really ruin my gaming experience with it, and I still do love this device. Between both of them though, this isn't bad. I did do a small adjustment to the panel itself by enabling the custom color temperature control in the AMD Adrenaline software. I set the color temperature to 6500 Kelvin, lowered the brightness ever so slightly to get some better black levels, boosted the contrast to about 130, and the saturation to about 105. This seems to make the world of difference with this panel, and it was looking good before, but it looks way better now. I highly suggest checking out some of these tweaks here so you can adjust the panel to your liking. If you've seen some of my other videos by now, you should know that I'm pretty picky about my panels, especially the color quality and the vibrancy of the panel itself. The panel on the low key zero is nothing but spectacular for an IPS. The colors are extremely vibrant and there's no washed out colors from what I can see. Yellows pop, blues look really saturated, greens look really good, and there's lots of detail throughout. Overall, this is an extremely decent IPS panel. I am really impressed with this. If we look at the Loki Zero versus the Steam Deck, you can see that the Steam Deck panel looks absolutely horrendous compared to the IPS panel on the Loki Zero. Without Vibrant Deck, this panel comes nowhere close to the panel on the Loki Zero. If we boost the contrast with the Vibrant Deck plugin to about 125, it does look a little bit better, but overall, I do think this screen looks way better. We can take a closer look to see how this panel stacks up to a couple other handhelds. The iNeo Air Plus also has a really decent screen and as you can see the colors on there are still actually pretty decent in compared to the Loki Zero. However between both of these I do think that there's a little bit more detail and the colors look a little bit better on the Loki Zero. The Air Plus also has a fantastic panel and this was one of my favorite panels on a handheld up to this point. However when putting it up against something like this though you can actually 
actually see quite the difference. I do think that the blues look a little bit better, especially on the zero or the plus. The shadows down here especially look better compared to the ones on the air plus. And this is with both panels at full brightness. Greens look really good on both panels. Yellows are really vibrant on both. But I do think that blue is probably the biggest difference between these two, as well as the darks. The shadows definitely show a lot better on the Loki Zero. If we put it up against the smaller regular Air Pro that has an OLED screen, this screen does look better, I think, but it is a little darker. I do really like a bright panel, and I think the Loki Zero down here does look better between these two. However, if you're after color accuracy or black levels, you can't beat the OLED panel. Each of these devices both have excellent panels though, so it's really down to preference which type of panel you prefer. Even against the Switch OLED, there is definitely a lot more brightness to be had on the Loki Zero. The Switch OLED does have perfect black levels being an OLED panel, and it's got really good color on it. If you're looking for a brighter panel, and you're looking for a really saturated panel, the Loki Zero definitely has a better panel I think in my opinion compared to the Switch OLED but I do think that the brightness on the Loki Zero is more to my liking. Both of these panels are at max brightness right now and the colors on the Loki Zero I think do show a little bit better than the ones on the Switch OLED. Of course this is just personal preference but I do like oversaturated colors so I do think this looks better at least to me personally. That was an overview of the console but let's turn this on finally and check out the experience when gaming and Windows itself. When you turn this on, it is going to be your standard Windows installation. The fan immediately turns on and it's definitely pushing out some air. Do like that startup logo, that's kind of cool. One thing I immediately notice is that the LEDs here are not actually that bothersome as I thought they would be. They kind of face inwards, so they're not really looking directly in your face, which can kind of be bothersome if you're gaming at night. The ones on the bottom actually look kind of cool too. I might leave those on. I initially was planning on shutting those off, but I do actually like that. As mentioned, the installation here is just your standard Windows installation, so I'm just going to go through this really quick. I also just noticed that I have a very, very small speck of dust under the screen protector there, which kind of sucks. Hopefully that doesn't bother me. The setup process was way quicker than I thought it would be. The setup process for Windows took about two and a half minutes before it booted me into my Windows installation here. That's not bad at all. With the basic Windows install, I'm using about 25 and a half gigs. So I have about 92, 92 gigs left on my SSD here. So I definitely want to use a micro SD card for any Windows or x86 handheld like the Steam Deck. You want to make sure you get a U3 A2 card. These are going to have a little bit quicker random read and writes and they're going to be ideal for Windows gaming. If you're looking to save a little bit of money, check out these Patriot micro SD cards. But if it's only a couple bucks more, definitely go for the A2 micro SD cards. These are going to give you the best performance on Windows devices. I'm going to hook this up to my capture card first so you can get a clear picture of what's going on. Coming into Windows here, I've done a little bit of a setup on it already. So I have put my micro SD card in there and I've loaded it up with some games from Steam. I've also done all the updates on my Windows drive. The first thing I did was disable defragmenting. Defragging your SSD isn't a great idea, so I've just shut that off. The other thing I did was disable indexing on my main C drive. All you have to do is right click on it, go to properties and uncheck this box, then click apply and let it go through and delete the indexing files. I went through the program list here to see if there was any bloat included in the computer and there wasn't anything except your standard Windows bloat. Just go through the list here and delete any bloatware you don't want that Windows is started with. You want to get rid of as much of this as possible because the computer is kind of bare bones and we want to use it for gaming. Once you've gone down the list and removed as much as possible, there's a couple other tweaks that you can do. In the advanced system settings, it's a good idea to always change the computer name here. In the advanced tab, go to the performance, then go to custom, and uncheck everything up top here. Everything above shadows under windows should be unchecked. 
in the advanced tab there, you can see our virtual memory is set to two gigs. You wanna leave this on since we're only running four or eight gigs of memory. In the system protection tab, I usually turn off Windows System Restore as I never find it works very well and it takes up a lot of disk space. In the last tab, remote assistance, you wanna uncheck this for security reasons. I like to use this app called Ultimate Windows Tweaker and I've been using this since Windows 7. Let's load it up and I'll show you a couple tweaks you wanna do in there. Under the customization tab, you can do a couple tweaks here. You can disable start animations to speed up the start menu loading. I like to remove the shortcut arrows from my shortcut icons. It looks a little cleaner on my desktop. You can also remove the shortcut suffix. Another good thing to enable is under the performance tab. I always like to auto end non-responsive applications. Turn off your search indexer. You can also disable the printer service if you're not using a printer with your device here. With those all checked off, here if you haven't done so already you also want to make sure to go down to the security and privacy tab i like to disable onedrive make sure to apply periodically to keep the changes disable windows error reporting you can also disable windows defender if you don't want that on there basically what this is going to do is really slim down your os under privacy i disable all this if you're using anything like discord you might want to leave app access to the camera and the app access to microphone and that's pretty much it in the power options menu here we want to enable a couple different things i like to turn off my display after about 10 minutes when it's plugged in though you can always set to never i also set the computer to sleep on never on plugged in and 45 minutes on battery with the default plan that we have here you also want to go down to the processor power management set the minimum to about 5% on battery and 100% with the maximum set to both plugged in and on battery. The AMD graphics power plan, you also want to make sure to set these to maximize performance on both battery and plugged in because the sleep functions of Windows don't necessarily play well with games. In the power options menu, you can also change what the power buttons do. Make sure to set that to hibernate when it's plugged in and on battery as well when you press the power button. Hibernate takes a second to shut down and start up but it does a lot better with gaming itself. I found many times using sleep it doesn't necessarily play well with games and sometimes it's crashed out the games. Using hibernate fixes that. Make sure to save those changes. In your steam interface settings make sure to set steam to run when the computer starts and also set steam to start in big picture. If you have a different front end for your windows games feel free to skip this. I like to use steam big picture mode as I've kind of gotten used to the UI on the Steam Deck. In the library settings before booting into big picture mode, make sure to enable the low performance mode. This disables certain graphical improvements and transitions, making Steam Big Picture seem a lot smoother. With all that applied, we can boot into Steam Big Picture mode. If you've ever used the Steam Deck before, this interface is going to be really familiar to you. I've gone ahead and added the battery life in the top right corner here, and you can go to the library here with all your games you have installed. Starting at the lower end of PC gaming, we have the original Doom here, running at 7 watts, and it's running great. Another thing I'm noticing too is that these joysticks are pretty sensitive, but we can adjust that in the settings. We're getting a solid 60 FPS though, but this is about as low as I can turn the TDP to keep it at 60. Let's bump it up a little bit and see what else plays. Blazing Chrome is another PC game that runs really good at the lower end. We're still at that 7 watt TDP and we're getting a flawless 60 FPS. It also looks really good on the screen. The rumble is also really good, which is surprising. Usually you don't see a good rumble like this on a handheld of this size. Have to say, I'm loving the rumble on here. Yeah, Blazing Chrome's pretty cool. I like it on here. Fun game. Horizon Chase Turbo could run at 7 watt TDP and it also looks really good with all these vibrant colors on there. It only drops one or two frames, but for the most part, it stays at a solid 60 FPS. Racing games are definitely going to be pretty fun on here, especially with these nice triggers. Let's see what else runs before I run into another sign. OpenGL games like Rune Factory 4 also run great on the console at native resolution or 720p. I'm running here at 720p just so I get a little bit bigger UI, but overall it looks good on both 1080p and 720p. I'm also playing all these games from the micro SD card and everything seems 
to load really quick. I've been a big fan of this game series ever since it launched on the original DS. If you're looking for a fun little relaxing game to play on a console like this, definitely recommend checking out Rune Factory. I've actually bought this game more than any other game. I bought it twice on the 3DS and I also bought it once on the Switch and once on Steam. Not sure why I bought it that many times, but it goes to show that when you like a game, it's worth buying that many times, I guess. Regardless, if you like Rune Factory, I think you're going to be pretty happy with this console. Eastward is another really fun little game to play on this console, but I'm only about three hours in so far. I won't show off too many spoilers here, but this is definitely a fun game I do recommend checking out. It takes about 13 watts to get a flawless 60, but you probably could drop it down to 12 if you're okay with a couple FPS dips. At 14 watts, Crosscode runs great on the Loki Zero. This is a really colorful game, so it really shows off that nice panel. Getting a couple FPS dips, but I also could bump this up a little bit past 14 if I wanted to get that to a solid 60. I definitely think this is where this console shines, is indie titles like this. I also made a guide for setting this up on Android. If you're interested, I'll leave that linked in the description below. At 14 watts, Persona 4 Golden runs great on here. If you've been looking for a alternative, to the PlayStation Vita and the Steam Deck's just too big for you, this might be the perfect console to play this game. 12 watts also seems to run pretty decent too, capping out at around 60 FPS in most situations. This definitely seems like another great game to play on the Loki Zero. Skull the Hero Slayer is also another fun little game that runs well on this console and I've been absolutely loving this game so far. With 720p on, you can run this game at about 15 watts, but you probably could drop it a little lower if you want to. 80s was another game that I wanted to check out and at 720p VSync on in borderless mode it runs at a solid 60 FPS. I'm only setting the TDP to 15 watts as well but I probably could lower it just a little bit and it would maintain that 60 FPS. Let's try dropping that just ever so slightly. Yeah so even at 12 watt TDP we can still maintain our 60 FPS. Absolutely solid at 12 watts. About where this device caps out is in Oblivion. You're going to be able to run Oblivion pretty decently at 720p full screen on medium presets. At 15 watts, Oblivion runs great and we're not capping out the CPU or the GPU in any way. It's definitely cool to see this game running on a handheld of this caliber. Overall, these are all the games that I've tested so far on the console that were great. A lot of these games just run absolutely flawless on here. Ace Attorney, so if you're more into visual novels, this is definitely a good console for that. Sea of Stars also runs great. Then of course the older games work really well on this console too. If you're a fan of a lot of these indie titles, I think you're going to be really happy with a console like this. To test the battery life on the Loki Zero, I wanted to keep this as realistic as possible. For all these tests, I set the brightness to 50% and the LEDs to 10%. Bluetooth and Wi-Fi was also kept on in all of these tests, and the TDP was set as low as possible while maintaining the 60 FPS. Doom 2 could go as low as a 7 watt TDP, and I got an average of 4 hours of battery life. All these games were played at 720p, and I thought it looked great on the panel. See if stars was next at 12 watts was the lowest I could play it at and I got about 2 hours and 20 minutes average of battery life. Oblivion was next up the list and I could play it on an average of 16 watt TDP while maintaining that 60 FPS lock. The game actually looked and played great at 720p medium and I was able to average 2 hours of gameplay. Titan Quest was the hardest game to run and even with a 20 watt TDP I could barely maintain the 60 FPS smooth. It would drop down to 57 or 58 occasionally but the game did still actually feel pretty good and it played fine. On Titan Quest I was able to average about an hour and 40 minutes as far as the Loki control center goes to open it up, tap this button. From there we can do a couple things like we can control the CPU boost mode, RTDP, which we can control just by sliding it around like this. We can also manually select our GPU frequency or set it to auto, so it'll just automatically adjust as it needs it. This is a good way to save power. We can also enable our FPS limiter. You do have to download RTSS to get this working. It can go from 60Hz all the way down to 10. As far as the fan mode goes, well the fan can get a little loud. I've set mine to manual at 35% and for all the games that I've been playing on it, I haven't 
noticed any overheating. For my case, it doesn't usually get over 60 Celsius, which isn't too bad. At 35%, it's also whisper quiet, so I can barely hear the fan at all. We can also set a application profile down here. So if we have a game up, we can tap this and then it'll enable per application settings rather than a system wide one. If we want to adjust the manual fan curve, we can just set to manual mode and then just drag it down here to just the fan. If we want to do a fan curve, we can do that too. Just tap the manual here, go to custom with the custom selected, hit the little fan up here and that'll bring up our fan curve where we can adjust the percentage per each individual temperature. On the bottom of the Loki control center, we can also adjust our resolution and our refresh rate. I've set mine to 720p at 60 hertz as I find it looks really good for this panel. We can also enable our lighting modes down here. And from here, we can control the brightness or the color. You can go all the way up to 100% and that gets pretty bright. Or you can turn it all the way down to zero to shut it off. Moving the color modes around here changes the color instantly. As soon as you let go, it'll swap the color. I usually leave mine on red then set the brightness down to about 20%. I don't usually like lighting on a console, but I think this looks really cool on this one because these aren't shining directly at you. The lighting on the side also looks really cool and I kind of like it. It's kind of grown on me. If you select the little gear here under the TDP, that opens up a new menu as well. From here, we can enable things like our volume level, our brightness, and the transparency of the low-key control center. I usually leave this at 100% and I like a bright panel, so I leave mine at 100% as well. So in the end, can I recommend the Loki Zero? Absolutely. If you're looking for a device under $300 US shipped, I don't think you can go wrong. That being said, of course, if you're looking for a device that plays more AAA games, you're not going to be getting that out of this device. However, there's a lot of indie games out there, and I think you're going to have a lot of fun with what this device can play. The build quality is superb. The screen is amazing. You're getting amazing joysticks. The bumpers and triggers are really good. The speakers are decent. Everything on this device is feeling extremely premium compared to what other devices you're going to see in this price bracket. The Win 600 has the same chip, but it was kind of hit or miss in the community. Compared to the Win 600 though, this device is way better. You're getting a device with some slightly better grips on it. You're getting full-size joysticks and that's amazing. You're also getting front-facing speakers, which is really good to see, and the face buttons are excellent. The one thing that surprised me was the screen itself. This is one of the best screens that I've seen in the device and I think the only device that I have that can compete with this is probably the Air Plus or the Ally. I do think that the screen in the Ally is obviously better but the one in here is really impressive and for $250 or $300 at the higher end don't think you're gonna find anything else with this kind of caliber of screen on it. Do I think it's worth waiting for the Loki Mini Pro? If you're focused heavily on indie gaming I think this is the way to go. You're going to save yourself a little bit of money and overall it's going to play most of what you're looking for. Indie gaming and old retro gaming is going to shine on this device. I personally don't want to use this device for emulation because I have my Android devices for that and all I really play is up to Dreamcast. It's a good little computer too so what you could do is you could play this at work, bring it home, hook it up to your TV or your monitor, use it as your computer with your keyboard and mouse and for $269 heck you're getting a pretty decent little computer too. This could watch 1080p video no problem and overall yeah I like it. Would I recommend this to someone? Absolutely. But I'm really curious to know what do you guys think of the Loki Zero? Are you interested in grabbing one or did you pick one up already? Let me know in the comments below. If you have any questions make sure to let me know in the comments. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos and as always thanks for watching.